A lot of the Asian people that I know who have spent some time in the States and they meet me, they're like, you're not really American, are you? I was like, well, I haven't lived there in like 16, 17 years, so technically I'm more, feel more comfortable here. Me, Joe Escobedo, an American who lived in China for five years before moving to Singapore 12 years ago. He's a lecturer at the National University of Singapore and the founder of a media business. Joe discussed the prejudices against Americans in China, how he balances American and Chinese cultural influences in his family life with his Taiwanese wife, and how learning Chinese has helped him overcome speech difficulties. I'm Max, your best friend on YouTube. Let's go. Your personality is American, like 100% or I would, uh, I would say it's more Asian if I had yeah? to pick. Yeah. <laughs> Even a lot of the Asian people that I know who have spent some time in the States and they meet me, they're like, you're not really American, are you? I was like, well, mm. I haven't lived there in like 16, 17 years. So technically I'm more yeah. feel more comfortable here. What part of you is Asian? What Asian features do you have, do you think? Uh, I mean, I don't like to like generalize Asians because obviously there's a, a oh, yeah. mix, but it's huge, yeah. I feel like what my friends tell me is that I'm a little bit more introverted, a little bit more soft-spoken yeah. um, versus once again, the stereotypical Americans who in some perceptions oh. is, is, doesn't fit that picture. So I think that's something. Also the importance of building relationships. I didn't really focus on much because I come from a small town in Oklahoma. Mm. So it's one of those places where you kind of know everybody. <coughs> um, so I think building those relationships here, I think has been extremely helpful in mm. you know, doing business and all the things that I'm doing currently. Do you speak Chinese? I do speak a bit of <laughs> Chinese. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you survive in China without, without the language? You can. But I would say it's definitely beneficial to learn the language, to build those relationships, make friends. I would say it's uh, yeah. yeah, quite imperative to learn yeah. language. In Singapore, probably not. I mean, you don't need any other language apart of English, right? Yeah, correct. I mean, you, call, you can go for to like Mandarin or Malay, but you really don't, don't have to, right? I, I, exactly. I think the only time I really speak it is the neighborhood I live in. Yeah. Um, a lot of the aunties prefer to speak Mandarin with me than versus English. Uh, so that's the only time I really use it over here. How should people react when you start speaking Mandarin? I think at least at first they're taken aback, they bit shocked, and then afterwards they just switch like I'm an old uncle and they would just <laughs> speak, speak to me like nonstop. So yeah. yeah, it's quite funny their first impression. I think now like China-America tensions are on the highest level, like maybe 10, like 15 years ago was like that. But do you have any prejudices against you as an American from Chinese people when you live there? So I'm always cognizant of this. Um, there's always perceptions because what they show and maybe the news may not be the most positive. I was very cognizant of, yeah. um, you know, portraying the best light of an American and, you know, just being respectful to the people. I think once they saw that, maybe we're still on the fence about most Americans, but they were okay with me and I was fine with that at the end of the day. What do you think the like, typical attitudes in terms of prejudices against mm -hmm. Americans in China? What, what Chinese people think, like, whenever you've been abroad, what do you think about Americans, um, America? Well, I think there's the news, obviously, that shows <clears throat> the unfortunate side of the U.S. with school shootings and, and you know, some of the violence. So I think yeah. that has kind of permeated throughout you know, different um, <clears throat> media around the world. And so some of them see that and they say, oh, the U.S. is such a dangerous place. I never want to go there. They see that side or they see like the, the Hollywood side. Uh, so it's kind of they're, they're torn. They're like, I want to go see Hollywood. I want to go see the Empire State Building, but mm -hmm. then I want to get shot. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like... <laughs> right on uh, top of the Empire State Building. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was like... So I had to kind of dispel some of those myths, but mm. from what I read now, once again, I haven't been there in a while, it has changed versus when I grew up there in the States. So maybe there is some truth to that, but I wouldn't be able to, to highlight it too much. You mean change in the US? Yeah, towards, change like, in the US. Like more dangerous, this kind of thing? Or? Well, I mean, I just hear stories because I have friends who go back there and they talk about the homeless um, epidemic and major cities is getting quite, quite bad, which wasn't really the case when I was there. So there's that and other kind of issues that the U.S. is yeah. struggling with. Would you ever move back to the U.S.? <laughs> I never say never. I mean, yeah. if, uh, but as of right now, no, Singapore is our home. Singapore is our home. Yes. Yeah. And I'm curious, like for your kids, because like your wife is Taiwanese, so you live in Singapore. So how important for you to preserve this American side of your like personality? in your kids? That's a very good question. So we try to give them both sides. So obviously we celebrate Chinese New Year and Christmas. I'll be honest, my wife does a better job of reminding me, hey, it's Thanksgiving, you want to celebrate her? Hey, Christmas is coming up, should we yeah. put the tree? So I would say that honestly, my wife does a better job at embracing it. Also because once again, she lived in the States for I think it was eight years, if I'm not mistaken. So she obviously knows quite well about the US culture. So 
she keeps the family in check in Chinese New Year, mm. um, in the Hongbao, as well as you know gifts around uh, yeah. Christmas. So she's responsible. For, she, she's for responsible. I, I take no credit whatsoever in our house <laughs> when it comes to that. Do you go with your kids to the US, like to see family and stuff? I admit I haven't been back to the States in about five years. <clears throat> so my daughter has been once. Uh, my son has never been. Also because it's just a very long flight to get yeah. back to the States. Probably about 24 hours. Yeah. With two young flight. kids, it's... Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I have two kids, so I can definitely relate. Yeah. yeah. When I researched your story, like I found out that you had a, like speech difficulties uh, when yes. you were a kid. I actually also had like how you called it uh, shattering. Shattering. Mm -hmm. I had shattering when I was a teenager, and then I still, I still sometimes it pops up when I'm like super tired. I like yes. trying to like p -p 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 -p, uh, speak the words, and that just doesn't work. Yes. And but I'm also doing a lot of like speaking and stuff. So and people have no idea that I have this like I had this speaking like problems. For you, it's kind of it's kind of similar ish, yeah. Yeah. Story, yeah. Yeah. Almost the same. So I had it. I still I still have it. So if I talk for so for too long, I'll start slurring my my speech. Mm. Um, so I have to really focus hard on enunciating because I have like a lazy lazy muscles. But I think one thing that really helped in hindsight was learning Chinese. Oh. Okay. Because when I learn Chinese, it forces you to use different muscles in your mouth because you're mm. making sounds that you wouldn't make in the English language. Mm. So I think it was almost like a workout for my, uh. my mouth. And I think that helped out some. <laughs> if I do speak for a long time, I will start slurring, slurring my speech. So I have to be very careful to yeah. enunciate properly. Any advice for people who are scared to like public speaking? But they don't want to learn Chinese? Like any advice? How, yeah, yeah, so how <laughs> if you don't, yeah, you don't have to learn Chinese. <laughs> One thing that I did, which was extremely beneficial for me, was to join Toastmasters. Uh, so yeah. Toastmasters, for those of you who are not familiar, it's like a global organization, usually small um, chapters, where people get together and they practice their public speaking. I think that was very helpful because I did that before I did any public speaking in, you know, in public, on, on stages and things like that. That was really to help me build my confidence. Mm. Because prior to that, I had zero confidence. Mm. Um, I was the kind of person who, in the office, who had an idea but was too scared to speak in front of even my, my classmates and uh, sorry my, my uh, colleagues yeah. and clients. And so I realized it had a detrimental impact on mm. my success. I was really plateaued. So I said, okay, what, what can I do to improve it? And I was doing research and I said, okay, Toastmasters. There was one just down the street from where I live and I said, okay, I'll try it out. And then the first time I went, they gave me something like table topics where you had to do an impromptu speech. And I remember I was like sweating profusely. I was fumbling all over the place. And, uh, it felt like I was up there for like 10 hours, but I survived that and then went through the program, started competing in competitions, won those, started doing small talks. And then I think the biggest talk I did was about 2,500 people. And now I just talk nonstop for, for a living. So yeah. it worked out in the end, but it was not easy for sure. So like your advice would be to practice. You cannot learn this thing like theoretically. You need to... I mean, there, there are books you can read, but it's one of those things where building up the confidence, I think many people lack. Mm. You can only do it um, by practicing. And yeah. for me, I started in very, very small, low pressure situations. So the very first talk I got invited to, it was for a women's um, entrepreneurial organization. And I think there was four people in the audience. And that for me was still nerve wracking, but I'm like, okay, if I can do four people, then hopefully one day I can do 400. So yeah, find very, very small opportunities to, to practice, whether it's Toastmasters or even, once again, practicing in front of your friends. Mm. So I tell my students, if you're nervous about presenting for a presentation, practice for some of your friends, people you feel comfortable with, but still get out those nervous kinks because I think that's what a lot of people really worry about is the confidence side. What's interesting, I, I think you also talked about it, it's, some, it's easier to speak in front of a thousand people because they're a little bit distant and they're like uh, dots <laughs> and compared to like a group of like 10 people or 15 people when they're like just next to you. I wholeheartedly agree. So I always make the joke that the only time you'll see me at a conference is on stage and out the door. <laughs> uh, reason for that is like you said, I find it far more comfortable speaking in front of a large group than I do in small groups. Mm. Even to this day, I still get a lot of anxiety because I don't know what to say. I'm not very good at small talk and, and things like that. Although I run a podcast and I do this for a living, when you're thrown in a situation where it's a little bit uncomfortable, you're meeting people you don't know, it's an environment you're not used to, yeah. um, I still find that nerve wracking to this day. And I've been doing, I don't know how many talks. So yeah, it still, it still happens. One of the worst moments in my speaking career, I wouldn't call it a speaking career, but my public speaking. I led this uh, like training about like business communication like 10 years ago. And there was a group of like, I think 12 people. So already quite a small group. 
And then at the break, the first break after two hours, two people come to me and just give me the piece of paper. I was like, what, what's that? And I roll it out and I see it says like, we want to leave, we don't like it. Oh. And so, and they didn't, they didn't say it out loud, but it was like, oh, f yeah. The energy goes down, I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure, okay. And then just 10 people, even, even less, I think it was 11 and then end up with nine people. But it was like super hard to, oh. you know, to get this, like, we don't like it. Yeah, we'll go. I remember like uh, coming home, like being like drained, no energy at all. But that's what it is. I think it's no like perfect way to start speaking without mm -hmm. these kind of situations. But I think, I mean, I, I've definitely faced that. I mean, no one's written to me or I also would have been crying on the way home. But, um, you know, there's, there's times where you do a talk and you see people leaving halfway through, like checking their phone. They're like, all right, I'm getting, I'm getting out of here. Um, so that has happened. But I think one thing you kind of have to tell yourself is there's going to be rejection. Even what you're doing now, even though you've been speaking for this many years, there's going to be some people that love what you do, love your style, and there's some people who are not going to be a fan. It doesn't matter what you do, no matter how many times you practice, how, many, how much engaging you think it is, there are just some people who will just not, it will not click with them. So I think that's something I'm starting to remind, trying to remind myself with because I will occasionally get those comments, very rarely, but I will get those comments. And it's like, oh gosh, like you put your heart and soul into it, but mm. at the end of the day, there's just some people who will not like you no matter what you do. It's, you actually have like a few good points about rejections, yeah? And you actually, you, you, I remember you gave examples of like in your career, how actually rejections led to something bigger, yeah? Later in your life. Oh yeah, so I've been rejected for most of my career. I think yeah. it started when I was uh, in uni university, my international business coach, my business professor said, Oh, you don't know anything about international business. Mm. Like, okay, well, I'll move to China in a couple of years. We'll, we'll see about that. And then this was a couple of years back, I was working for a media company and uh -huh. they rejected a lot of my ideas and kind of the formats that I wanted to try out with, which was more video podcast related. This was before the big boom. And I said, okay, fine. Well, if you, you know, don't want me doing it, I'll just do it my own. And that's when I started my media company. So I take those rejections as almost motivations. Uh -huh. When someone tells me, oh, you can't do this, Mm. I'll say, okay, well, we'll see in you know, six months or a year whether or not you're correct. So that's kind of, <laughs> in a weird way, what fuels me yeah. uh, is the rejection. And yeah, I've been rejected so many times. People told me, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. You'll never make it in this career. You'll never make it in that. So after a while, you just get used to it and say, okay, well, let me try it out. <laughs> yeah. What's the principles of personal branding? Like, let's say, three main principles. I think the most important one is to be basically what you're doing. Be interested in other people. You know, there's that Dale Carnegie quote about, you know, it takes two, was it two years for get, to get someone interested in you? Mm. Um, it takes maybe two minutes or two months for you to become interested in them. Mm. I think I'm, I'm butchering the quote, but it's essentially talking about the importance of being interested in other people because when you do that, other people are interested in you. And I think I learned that when I was a journalist. People I, I interviewed tended to like me because I barely spoke. <laughs> mm. I just asked them a lot about themselves. Mm. And so they got to open up, they felt more comfortable with me, and that turned into some of the best relationships I had post afterwards. And it worked out great for me as an introvert because I don't like talking anyways, although I'm talking now. <laughs> and then in, I did the same thing with the podcast where I said, okay, I'm not the hero of each episode. Mm. Each of the guest star. I'm just someone facilitating it or asking questions. Everyone else that comes in the show, they are the real star. And I'm gonna make it that way, where I'm gonna highlight them in the imagery, I'm gonna make you know, them talk 90% of the time. And we're really gonna pull out their key insights and make them look good. So I think by taking that approach, it's, you know, helped me build some extremely positive relationships because it goes back to, I use the analogy of debits and credits in mm. banking. Um, a lot of people, when they do personal branding or relationship building in general, they tend to take, <laughs> right? They say, okay, yeah. uh, can you give me a job? Can you introduce this person? Can you blah, 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 without actually adding any value to that relationship because most of the time, everyone in the world will be thinking about themselves 99.9% .9 of the time. So you really have to pause and say, okay, what additional value, how can I make this other person's life better? So whether you do that in person, through a coffee, um, through a networking event, or even the content you put out. So the number one question I tell all my students, and they tell me to this day is the number one best advice I've ever given them, is very simple question, what's in it for them? Mm. Meaning what's in it for your target audience? If your content is that kind of self-promotional, hey, look what I did, how great I am, et cetera, et cetera. It's not adding any value to the people who are consuming it. I'll give you an example. A buddy of mine reached out to me a few months back, and he's also in terms of teaching. He says, hey, why aren't my posts getting a lot of traction? 
and I just had a quick look at it, and I said, okay, well, you basically told everybody that you did this talk. What's in it for them? And he was like, oh, yeah, you're right. And I said, what should I do differently? And once again, there's no wrong or right way, but I shared my approach. So every time I do a talk or a workshop or something in the public, I will probably take a photo and share it on LinkedIn. Mm. But most importantly, I will add at least three key takeaways or three key tips that I've learned. Mm. Why? Because those people who weren't able to attend that workshop or that conference, or whatever I did, they still can learn something from it. And I think just that one slight tweak in terms of the mindset of how I put out content has had a massive um, impact on you know, why people like me. I have no, still, have, still have no idea why people like me, but I, that's one of the reasons that I hear uh, mm. from the community. The one I wanted to add up on, on the, like what I can do for, for, for the person. One step further is like, don't ask to the person, if, especially if it's just you just met, like how can I help? Mm. Because they need to work in the process, like they don't know like what resources you have. So it's kind of on your side, you kind of need to figure out what resources you have and how it can be connected to the problems or like goals of the person. So it, it's not like, how can I help? I don't know, dude, yeah, thanks for asking, but yeah, maybe I, I tell you later. Yeah. But it doesn't work this way. So it's kind of, it's on, if you really genuinely want to help and then you want to build a relationship and maybe you want something out of these relationships later, you need to like figure out how, what you can do for the person. Yeah, Right. I, I, can, I completely agree. <clears throat> so it goes back to being interested in their people and their person. When you're having that conversation, you can find out what are their challenges they're facing. Um, what, what are the goals they want to do, whether it's career-wise or professionally. One thing I'll do is say, look, if they tell me about a specific challenge they're having, I may share a resource. Or I may say, hey, I know you're talking about you know, your discomfort with public speaking. Well, I have a resource that I came across. Would you like me to share it with you? So it addresses what they're talking about. Or, hey, um, when we're speaking, you, you mentioned you want to do more public speaking. I, I know a couple event organizers. Would you like me to introduce you to them? So it always is, like you said, a follow-up of what they mentioned in the conversation. So you are being proactive. Because to your point, when you leave it wide open, you say, hey, what can you do for me? You're putting work on the other person. <laughs> Correct? You're like thinking, okay, well, now I have to think about how <laughs> you can do for me. And I have to like, yeah. I don't want to do that. So going back to if you're interested in other people and you ask the right questions, you can find out what their challenges and ambitions are. And then if you have resources or you have connections you can refer them to, that's the best way. Do you have any regrets in life? I've had a lot of failures. I think more than anyone that I know. But if you ask me if I have any regrets whatsoever to this day, no. Because I, I try to live every day like it's my last. And that's because there's many times where I've, I've had many near-death experiences throughout my life. And so I just say, okay, well, you know, if today's your last day on Earth, what are you going to do? Mm. So I'm going to speak with Max and we're going to have a fun conversation out in the, you know, the park here. That's what I want to do. And that's how I live every day of my life. I guess it makes you more happy. If you kind of try to explore life and live a solo day in your life. Yeah, is it like what makes you happy, I think? Uh, I think it makes me appreciate things more. Mm. Um, it makes me focus <laughs> on things I want to be doing. Because the older I get, you know, with the gray hair coming in, I realize that I don't have forever on this earth. So what can I do that's going to make an impact for the next generation? Which is partially one of the reasons that I started teaching, is I said, okay, I've learned a decent amount, I failed a lot, I can take that all to the grave, or I can share that with the next generation. And that's kind of what I've been doing, is sharing life lessons, things that have worked, things that have don't worked, and that's my way of hopefully giving back before I, I do pass. Maybe it's tomorrow, maybe it's, I don't know, next week, who knows. But that's the impact I want to try to make before I, I leave this world. Why it's important to you if you leave this world? Like why, why it's important to leave this impact? I just think about the people that impacted me when I, early in my career, whether it's a former boss or a grandparent, and the wisdom that they gave me at that time, I think completely changed who I am and the mm. way I think. And if I wouldn't have had them in my life, I think my life would have been much more different, uh, probably more difficult. I really appreciate those who came before me and provided guidance and, and you know, guided me a little bit. So I'm just trying to pay it forward. I'm just trying to pay back what those who gave me for the next generation. Mm. You know, my grandma used to say, if you watch just one YouTube video, you're already a good person. But if you watch a second one straight away, you're an incredible person. So do it right now. Don't upset my grandma.